Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for our Career Booster webinar series here at Grantham University, where today we will be presenting our Career Insider with the Department of Homeland Security, who's going to talk about their Pathways program. Just uh, a couple of reminders here. Today's, record, today's session is being recorded, and those recordings will be made available to you shortly after today's broadcast. And I do invite you to ask any questions that you have for our presenter today, and you can do so within the GoToWebinar software. There is both a questions uh, feature and a chat feature, so uh, you use either one of those to answer any questions, ask any questions that you have, and we will cover those um, at the end of the presentation. So moving on, just to remind you of Grantham's uh, mission, which is always to provide quality, accessible, affordable, professionally relevant programs in a continuously global, changing global society. My name is Jeremy Bell, Career Services Manager, and I'd like to welcome today's special guest, Dr. Mike Edwards with the Department of Homeland Security. Welcome, Mike. <laughs> Thank you. So, so tell me a little about yourself. Well, I did 23 years in uniform, U.S. Army. Um, I first started out my first half of my career on tanks. Uh, Abrams, Bradley, Stryker, name it, I've, I've ridden in one. I uh, spent the second half of my career working as a foreign area specialist, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa specifically. Once I retired out of uniform, I went on to become an, an instructor at the uh, U.S. Army Command and General Staff College here in, in Kansas, and then now I'm working with U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services. Awesome. Great. So today, what we're going to do is we're going to um, we're going to help our listeners become more familiarized with the various components within the Pathways Program um, with the United States government. We're going to learn uh, talk about the connection between the Pathways Program and how to apply within uh, USA Jobs, how to uh, use that function, and then uh, you're going to share with us your personal path um, through gov from military through government employee um, employment. Um, and so we're going to discuss those things today. So, Mike, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you. And here we go. All right. And this would be no surprise to anyone that who's on the call, especially up to our, our veteran population, which I understand is very significant within the college. Mm -hmm. But there are many different ways you can get into the federal government or opportunities to get out, I shouldn't say. And that's two things I wanted to make clear. First, to veterans, this is not a job guarantee. This is just getting your name closer to the, the hiring authority or the ability for the hiring authority to see your name uh, if, it, if you, these programs do not exist. And to the civilians who have never been through the military, and that's something also I want to emphasize, I get a lot of pushback from some of the civilian employees within our agencies. That, oh, well, I'm not going to apply because, you know, it, it's all veterans who are getting the jobs anyway. That's not true. You still have to have the same skills. You still have to have the, the, the matchup on the resume with what the job description says. Uh, just because your resume gets in front of the, the reviewer does not mean you are going to get the job. You still have to have the skills. But Veterans Recruitment Authority, uh, Veterans Employment Authority, 30% uh, disabled, those are all things that are uh, available to us that you should, if you are eligible for them, uh, you should really go ahead and try for them. I want to make a point, and just as I was coming here or I was preparing last week to discuss uh, these various um, opportunities, I was in there with our senior HR person for my district. My district is, is 200 federal employees spread out over 11 states within the Midwest. Uh, largest office, maybe about 50 people. We have small one person offices uh, spread throughout in four different cities. But we were trying to fill a position in a hard to put location. I believe it was Sioux City and uh, Fargo. And it just so happens the person who had given their resume to help us fill that position fell under one of these appointment authorities. And so they looked at the resume, hey, the skills match. Hey, they're VRA, they're veterans, they're eligible. Let's see if we can get these guys, and they just both happened to retire within, over the summer, so they're going to be a perfect fit for us to be able to put them into those two positions. But it would not have happened had they not applied under the VRA and we didn't have their uh, resume sitting right there in front of the senior HR person. I say we, I'm only tangentially involved with the hiring process. I get to look at resumes and, and grade them. I, I'm not, that's about the limit of my uh, involvement in the hiring process. But it, again, 
the point I'm trying to make is if you're eligible for it, try it. Uh, attempt to put it in there. But again, remember my first caveat up front, it's not a guarantee that you will get the job. <clears throat> Non-competitive appointments for military spouses, that's used a lot, or at least from our agency's perspective, that's more used overseas than it is here in the United States. And then the disabled veteran in the VA training rehab program. Within my agency, I've only seen one person who, have come, who has come through that program. Uh, it's not used highly. Is not a big, uh, big one that is used. The non-veteran uh, appointments down there that you see there, there Schedule A. Again, I, I know one individual, well, one individual who's used it successfully to his benefit. Uh, he came in uh, non-veteran. He went through school with a disability, a documented disability from a doctor. Said he had a learning disability, which surprised the heck out of me because if you ever met this guy, you would think he was just the, the smartest person in the world. Anyway, that dis, that document disability got him into the edu, into the agency because because of his Schedule A appointment, he was able to get into the agency. He was then um, able to compete for a competitive appointment afterwards uh, once he was inside the agency. So if you are eligible for any of those, again, try for it. That it, it is your right. You earned it. It's not a gift. It is not a, a blanket. You will get the job, but if you're eligible, uh, I go for it. I, I say try for it. Okay. Now I'm talking about the pathways programs and some of these other things listed up here. When, especially within our agency, U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, and for DHS as a whole, Homeland Security, we look at pathways programs, and it is those four different items underneath there that you talk about. Individual. Those are internships. And internships can be just for the summer. They can be for any longer. It just depends on what the job is listed for uh, and what particular uh, activities they expect for the job. I was just telling Jerome before we started talking, I was looking at our numbers uh, within U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, and every year we have about 200 part time jobs. And most of those 200 uh, are the internships that, that we're talking about. And again, for those hard to fill offices, a lot of those offices use the internships as a way to get people into the door. Uh, they, and and it is, uh, if it's something that you're interested in, something that you want to try, I would uh, uh, urge you to go ahead and try it and, and at least try to get your foot in the door with the internship. The recent grads, if you're within graduation, uh, it's, it's a, a striking uh, distance for you. Uh, and I was just, I also, just before we started talking, that was another story. And a young lady that I work with closely here in the Kansas City area, she started as a recent grad Pathways internship. She was originally on as a contractor for our agency. And her mother pointed out, this is, hey, you're graduating this summer. Why don't you put in for this recent grad uh, internship? And she did. Uh, she got the position. And she has also risen up through the agency as well. And now where she is a training officer, like myself, working for the agency. Foreign scholarships, not, uh, I have not uh, seen a whole lot in use. Uh, I know our Minneapolis office uses it a lot uh, to try to get people in. And again, it's for a temporary position, or it's not intended to be a full-time, long-term position. But a lot of the born scholars that we have brought in, at least in our Minneapolis office, have been converted into a competitive full-time position. Uh, and there are specific requirements on it, and we'll see that on the, on the next sheet. Uh, it doesn't have the specific for the, the borns. For those of you in the in the DMV area, and I had to look that up to figure out what it was, but as the District Maryland in Virginia, <laughs> I'm like, who, who would be in the, uh, <laughs> in, the, in, the, in the in the driver's license office? I know, <laughs> not the Department of Motor, Motor Vehicles, but. Uh, yeah, the summer internship program is a big, big program in in the D.C. area, and that's one of the things that they really, uh, in fact, our headquarters talks about that all the time, about the number of interns they bring in during the summer, uh, and a lot of them, again, uh, they get a chance, opportunity to convert those jobs into uh, a full-time government position. One of the biggest one, or the, the one I know personally, is our our current attorney within our district here in Kansas City. As a child, he participated. Um, because he just happened to be in D.C. area growing up, and he participated every summer uh, as an intern. 
And then when he did finally come to the government after he finished law school, uh, what he found out was that all that time counted for his time here in the government. And he had that, those, I guess, 12 extra months onto a, a whole year added onto his uh, uh, time in, in, in service uh, for the government. So he really enjoyed that. He learned a lot. Uh, it wasn't anything dealing with the law, the different agencies that he worked for, but he also speaks very highly of the summer enrichment program. And if you have students who can participate, or if you know of someone who can participate, you should urge them to go ahead and try. President, the Presidential Management Fellows Program, that's a more higher level program, and it's on the next sheet. There are a lot of different uh, portions of that uh, that go into the program, and it, it's very specifically targeted at certain specialties uh, and certain high-level positions. I had the uh, pleasure of meeting at least one presidential management fellow when I went through the, our, they call it BASIC for the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, but it is our initial training program for the, the largest portion of our workforce, which is the Immigration Services Officer. And she was there, she was going to learn to become an Immigration Services Officer, then immediately within the presidential management her they had it laid out for her. Her program was she would learn how to become an ISO, then learn how to become a refugee uh, uh, adjudicator, and then she was on to uh, policy positions within either our agency, Homeland Security, or within the State Department. So they had a specific path laid out for her uh, that would get her to the level that they wanted her to be at, to be a presidential management fellow. And then the student volunteer employment programs, I see that uh, not so much in our a lot of that going on in USCIS, but I do see that uh, I'm associated with Fort Leavenworth. I haven't taught there for CGSC, but I saw a lot of interns, uh, student volunteer uh, employment at, in, the, in the staff college where they got an opportunity to, to participate, uh, learn things there, how federal offices work, and do different things there with the Combined Arms Center and other portions. <clears throat> and we'll go ahead and switch to that. And while you're looking at that and you're taking a long, are there any questions so far about some of the things that I've, I've talked about? Okay. Uh -huh. um, could you, I do have a question. So the internship program, could you um, kind of paint a picture for what, what that experience is like? So when someone is brought on at, in one of these internship type roles, like what is, what is the process or experience look like for them while they're in that period? The current one that we're working with today, or he's, again, the young lady I mentioned before who's a training officer, she brought one in specifically as a trainer because that is the area that he, he's in education. He said he wanted to deal with something in education. So when they lined him up, they aligned him up with her with her office and the internship is specifically, and the, the details are laid out in the position description. Okay, he is to do these types of duties. Uh, he can't, obviously he can't teach uh, any of the specific items but all the training management, the training, uh, the learning functions that he can do, those are laid out in his internship. So he gets to do all the neat little things that most trainers don't want to do, like copy papers. <laughs> <laughs> Enter information into the learning management system, update rosters, and, and things like that. So he gets all the administrative uh, aspects of it, minus a little bit of, of teaching. But his, the greatest piece of it that he does like, and he enjoys talking with us about, is actually watching us go through the training, how we prepare for the training portion, how we get the classes set up, uh, where we need to go for the information that we need if we're trying to set up a class or anything. So he has uh, described how, or his, one of the things he has to do for this for this beginning internship is to write a paper about what his experiences were and how he did it. And then his outbrief with us, that's what he told us is like, probably, you know, obviously I didn't enjoy doing all the paper copying and all this other stuff, but here's what I learned. Mm -hmm. Here's how I think I, I'm going to apply it into the future as I go into education realm, and then here's where I think I will go forward. So he really, and I think he was only there with us for six months okay. in that particular internship, and he, he really got a lot out of it in understanding where he was going. So the experiential learning was what really, really helped him. So I know you mentioned he was there for six months, and I'm not... I, you might have mentioned this already, but what is the average length of these programs that people will be in these positions? It, it, each one of them is, is different. And okay. it, like I said, with the, the numbers being 200, I want to say most of them are, are there for a year. 
But I know for specifically, of course, with the summer programs, they're, they're only there for the summer, three months in advance. I believe his, his was only six months, only because that was the time frame between he was going uh, between his graduate uh, or undergraduate program to his graduate program. That's why it ended up being six, only six months for that particular program. But I think most of them are traditionally a year. A year. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Uh, the, the other thing I didn't mention also about it, for any of these programs, for the veterans, hiring authorities, for the uh, programs that look on USA Jobs, and I know that's one of the things we've talked about. A lot of people do not pay attention, enough attention to what's on, listed under USA Jobs. That really gives you a lot of what you want, uh, need to know about that particular job and whether you, your skills line up for it. And if it's eligible for one of the internships, if it's eligible for a pathways program, it'll be it'll be listed under there. Uh, they a lot of times they'll do both. They'll post a job as an individual job itself as a person that they want to hire. But if it's like like I said, in some of the more hard to fill locations or some locations that are constantly being refilled uh, in Baltimore, New York, Los Angeles, uh, in those areas, a lot of times they'll list the job also as an internship. So they say, okay. Here's a permanent position, and we're also offering as an internship just so we can get someone in the door and start getting someone trained to do the position. Can I add one more thought to that? As, oh, far, sure. as, as far as USA Jobs goes, I just wanted to let uh, the listeners know that, you know, as you mentioned, is right, USA Jobs, it is, you know, it is a great resource, but they look for very specific information. Applying for those jobs within USA Jobs, I know a lot of those federal positions, they have very specific information that they want you to share right. um, within those um, applications through the occupational questionnaire and even your resume. There's a lot of specific information that they want, and I just want to remind folks, if you have any questions about that, be sure to contact our team, and we can help you on this end and walk you through and make sure your information is um, what they're asking for. So. Uh, and and I, I'm glad you guys do that because that is one of the things I say. My the only thing piece I have in the, in the hiring process within my agency right now is they'll give me a stack of resumes. Uh, it's a grade. They say go from a hey, go from number one to if I get a stack of ten, go from one to number ten. Tell us who's closely related to the jobs. And a lot of the issues that I see with them is person will give me uh, the person will turn in a generic resume. It has nothing to do with what was on the USA Jobs. USA Jobs tell you what you want. Except, yeah. <laughs> that, I tell everyone the, the one of the one of the things I love about uh, federal opportunities, especially when you look at USA Jobs, is that unlike most corporate positions, or I guess we'd say civilian positions, you know, they do a good job at saying, okay, here's what our requirements are, here's you know, experience, education, um, what have you, but with those positions, they tell you exactly, you know, exactly how much experience you want, exactly what we want your skill level to be, and we want you to be able to explain it. So, you know, and we've seen that. I mean, I've, I've seen the rating system. It's like the best eligible. I'm mean, right. getting the words uh, right. not correctly, but there is a certain ranking that you will get upon right. application. And if you don't, you know, if that information isn't just right, it's going to, you might be number 10 out of those 10 or or 12 or 13 or 15. So read them carefully and answer the questions, you know, and we, and general resumes, you know, just kind of throwing my career services hat on here. Mm -hmm. You never want to send a generic resume for anyone, right. whether government or uh, civilian, you always want to tailor that resume to that opportunity. Yes. Um, even more so with this, because, you know, they have an applicant tracking system, just like a lot of organizations do. And if you don't speak specifically to those opportunities, uh, Dr. Edwards may not see it <laughs> yes. or read it, so, so be specific. And, and I'm glad you brought up that other point, too. That's something else that I, I deal with a lot with. Well, I won't say a lot, but mm -hmm. I'll, I'll have employees who will send me their, because they know I, I grade resumes, they'll send me a resume and they'll ask me for my opinion on it. And here's the other, other thing that really bothers me, especially for my military brethren. You know, we'll put down on there that we, you know, I was the observer controller for the MCTP, uh, for two, uh, you know, two years, and that sounds great. I know what I just said, mm -hmm. but someone who's never been around the military has no clue to what I what I just did for those two years. Right. And I have to tell them, guys, you got to break that down to the closest civilian equivalent, so you can uh, they can identify the skills that you actually used as an observer controller to help you get that job. And that was uh, and I, recent my re most recent one, and my best friend down in uh. uh 
Orlando, Florida. He's a cop. He's going for another job out of the law enforcement uh, realm, but he put on there something that did, had to deal with him being a policeman. I said, uh, Tim, you need to explain that. He said, but that's the official title. I said, I don't care. I said, unless the person reading that resume has done that job himself and knows what it is, you need to explain what that is. I don't care what the title is. Mm -hmm. They don't know. I don't know. I'm sure they don't know unless they were a policeman. You need to change that. Uh, he fought me on that. Of course, he's, he, he <laughs> was yeah. mad at me for a few days, but you, it, you eventually get it. And that <laughs> and it it, it ha that conversation, you know, happens a lot in anything that you look up. Um, even if you go online and talk about okay, military civilian translation to resume, that's you know that's a point that is brought up all the time. Is that, and I you know try to tell folks is that if you and I read something recently, someone said um, if you explain your job or find a civilian that you know, and I'm speaking as a civilian, but I've worked with military for nine years. Mm -hmm. And, but if you speak to someone in your civilian friend, if they don't understand on first explanation of what you do, you need to clarify. Yes. You know, so if, if they don't understand it, it's very well likely that that HR rep or that person at office of personnel management or what have you may need clarification as well. So. Um, I got one quick question that came in from Crystal. Um, I live in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, and it is so hard to get a job at our uh, VA, the Veterans Administration. Right. They rarely hire outsiders, but when they are hiring outside, is the resume key to getting in? Yes. I, and again, this is one person's opinion, and I'm just basing this off of what we do in our agency. Yes, the resume is very key to getting in. So the way I was talking about, so I was talking about with those two individuals who happened, their resume happened to be there. We only received their resume because it was at a job fair at Fort Leavenworth, uh, and they did what you said not to do. Was mm -hmm. They had a generic resume. Yep. They passed it off to us. Uh, he, he had written on there, um, retires summer 18, and the current position just happened to trigger uh, or just happened to match something that was on those two resumes. And we're like, hey, we can get these two positions filled right now. And these both are veteran. Yes. And it's all because they had a resume that they were able to tell. Uh, we could tell that it matches our, our position. So yes, do pay attention to your resume. Agreed. <clears throat> uh, all right. We were talking about the program eligibility. I thought you said, like I said up there, and these are the pathways requirements and a lot of things are going and it, you likely will not see a lot of this stuff uh once you get once you start to do go through the process on usa jobs and apply for the job uh and you get that far into the process you'll see all the rest of those requirements down there uh as well as the agreement and uh the qualifying portions um further on down the road so that's not a big one so you can go on okay. to, to the next slide I did. Oh, and there was some other names. I did want to make sure that you all knew. And DHS is trying to tell, let everyone know that yes, we DHS is hiring. We are looking for people in a lot of different areas of our government, uh, specifically our agency. Um, there were some other what, um, these hiring events going on around the area, uh, but by the time I sent them the slides, he had already had these. And then I had two more that are not listed on here. Uh, for those who are in the Arlington, Texas area, there is going to be something at the Arlington Convention Center June 26th and June 27th. There's a DHS law enforcement hiring event. So if you're interested um, and need more information, I don't know if you have somewhere you can post that on there. Mm -hmm. Can the they time. also find them on this web link here? It, they, sh they should be listed on there as okay. well. But I don't I know if that specific event, because it was uh, specifically targeted for Arlington, Virginia. Okay. Yeah, we can definitely share that. I mean, Arlington, there. Texas. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. But yes, we are hiring. We are looking for law enforcement. We are looking for other areas. You can see up there, ICE, Immigration and Customs Enforcement. And for those who aren't familiar with the way the agency works, we have 11 different uh, components within Homeland Security. Um, ICE, CBP, and USCIS, Asian, we are the ones who primarily deal with immigration. ICE is the law enforcement arm of immigration. If you haven't heard about them in the news lately, uh, all the raids that they've been doing, uh, checking customers, uh, they are the ones who, like I said, they carry the badges, they work with local police, uh, and they pick up uh, usually the bad guys uh, that we, the benefits 
portion of the agency have identified, say, hey, this person is overstay on their visa or this person is not eligible to be here, uh, and then they pick them up. And then CBP, obviously Customs and Border Protection, is on the border, and they are the ones in airports as well, uh, make sure that person coming in is, is uh, eligible to be in. And, and I'm sure maybe somebody will ask or somebody, maybe they won't, but usually we always get the question say, it's, hey, as the first, <laughs> As your first assignment in CBP is usually on the on the southern border, and yes, generally, normally, usually, um, for all the people that I talk with in CBP, well, once you once you are accepted and you come in, your first assignment is going to be on on the southern border. So if that's an issue for you, you, know, you may not want to check with CBP. And there, I mean, there's the off chance you can go somewhere else, but that you, that your your starting career is going to be on the southern border. <clears throat> I did have one more comment from Amanda who just wanted to let us know that there is also resources such as Work for Warriors that will assist military personnel oh. in translation from military jargon to civilian, uh, to civilian terms. Thanks, Amanda. That, that's uh, a good one. Yeah, that's a very um, good one. When I retired in 2009, um, the local service here, uh, the only place they sent me to was CNET, and that was very hard to translate the, my military career into uh, but I'm glad she brought that one up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, it, and it's a good point. You know, it's for and and as Minda mentioned, there are ton, a lot of resources um, out there, many of which we can share with you. Um, but I think it is, you know, I think the primary thing is, you know, one understanding, you know, if you are transition transitioning from the military, understanding what your goal is or what direction you want to go to post military. You know, it may be one of these opportunities that uh, Dr. Edwards is mentioning today, you know, or it could be something um, different or civilian or what have you, but understanding first your goal and how to trans, you know, translate your experience into those opportunities. It's a big point. I know we probably mentioned it more than once today, but it's it's super important and, you know, we're here to help with that. So, oh, yeah. So, yeah. Okay. And then here's, I like doing this uh, as, a, as an instructor mostly. Um, because I know just listing out of everything I've done is, is a little even more boring. People less less likely to remember it, less likely to take it, make pay attention to it. But you can see up there, long military career. I've, I've got things up there. And for those who are curious, I actually started my doctorate degree uh, or studies as I was sitting on the uh, port operating base in uh, uh, Q West, and I'm sure some Army guys are. are, are, are are familiar with that piece of territory, but Kyara West in Iraq, I decided, it was, you know, months before I was supposed to rotate back home, I said, you know what, I'm, I'm probably going to get out of the military soon. I don't know what I want to do. I thought then that I would get out and become an elementary school principal somewhere, but, you know, life took another turn. And so I said, well, let me sign up and, uh, and start working on my doctorate degree in education. Came back. Uh, stayed at Fort Leavenworth for a little while as an instructor there at the Staff College. Uh, continued on um, with the, and someone heard me mention, Mission Command Training Program. College called back. They knew I was working on my doctorate, and they said, hey, Mike, how soon can you retire? Do you want to come over here to back to the college as a civilian? I said, sure, that would be great. <laughs> and so I did. And then just on a lark, you know, and I enjoyed my time at the staff college as a van and as working as an instructor there. First, I started just as a, a tactics instructor, and I became a curriculum developer. Again, they were looking at my degree uh, in education and leadership, and they said, well, we need you to work on curriculum. And I said, sure, I'll work on curriculum. Uh, and then just goofing around in USA Jobs one day, I looked and saw the training officer, the current position I hold, listed on there. And they said they were either looking for people who were 1801, which is a, a law enforcement officer in uh, government parlance, or they were looking for a 1701, someone with an educational background. Again, I, I wasn't dissatisfied with my job at CGSC. I just, hey, this is cool. Let me see if I'm, I even qualify for it. And then sure enough, I got a call uh, once the job closed that says, can, when, how soon can you do an interview? Next thing I know, I think I put the application in in January. By October, I was working for USCIS as a training officer. And the transition was pretty smooth. Uh, the big problem right now, and I'll go ahead and admit this about our agency, uh, DHS-wide is the security holdup. And I think that's uh, probably the government-wide right now. 
even though I had a top secret clearance with the U.S. military, um, the agency still goes through a security background check for all new employees, and that seems to hold a lot of people up. So if you apply with USCIS specifically, and I won't, I won't castigate the entire DHS family, but uh, there will be a lot of holdups with our, the background check process. Is there anything that um, applicants can do with that process or prepare for to make that any smoother? We, we, we are trying to figure it out. Um, just to, and it seems that with the OD, it does go a little bit further. If you have no experience with, uh, whatsoever with the government or even with the military, um, it just seems to take forever for a background check to go through. And, and like I said, we, we're, we're trying to figure out ways to, or why that is happening and figure out ways to mitigate it just so we can get, because we're, we're, we, we've lost a number of candidates just because background because checking this, yeah, background check didn't go through. Is it because just that it's easier to retain, retrieve that information from a veteran or yes. service member than it would be from a civilian? Yes, okay. it is. Uh, so now as I've gone, been with part of the agency, not the, you know, some of the other things up there that I, I wanted to point out. The agency has sent me to other di additional training. Like I said, I went through the basic course. Even though I do not adjudicate, I do not see immigrants who come through our office. I do not talk about uh, whether they get a green card or not. That is not my position. They sent me to that course to be able to understand it so I can be able to teach different aspects of it. But they have also sent me through Kirkpatrick level training as a trainer. I have to know the four levels of, of uh, understand the four levels of evaluation, be able to apply that to learning. Uh, they sent me to crucial conversations. That was one of the big things that I go around teaching to supervisors right now is the ability to talk to, um, the, the course is just the ability to communicate, period. But we are trying to get all our communicators on, or all our supervisors on the same level, be able to commu uh, communicate better with their employees. And then you see there down there at the bottom, the certified professional and training management. And which is a big part of my job. And I tell uh, all my buddies back in the military that when they ask, what do I do for Homeland Security? I said, think of me as the battalion S3 training. I said, if you can imagine what that job was, you know, responsible for setting up all the training, getting the ranges set and everything like that. That's all I, <laughs> that's all I really do. I very rarely get to, uh, to teach as, uh, or I teach as, I don't teach as much as I would like to. I would really would like to be able to teach much more um, than just the crucial conversations and strength finders and things that that's what I don't have, strength finders. Then the other piece up there is coaching. A lot of the supervisors, because they know I'm a I'm former military and understand I, I understand leadership a little bit, <laughs> they they come to me with co uh, to co be coaching on problems. Okay, what is my leadership style? What is it I need to do? be able to leave uh, federal employees um, and then what things can you help me with what can you give me to read what can you give me classes to take um, where can where can you help me uh, be a better supervisor manager or, or leader in our organization and I and that is part of my job there is to take them through that other stuff there is just to rest rest of my life that <laughs> unless you have any questions ever yeah. what kind of cat is that uh, just, just a, just a cat. Just a cat. <laughs> and it's funny. Uh, we lost previous previous name. We had another cat named Yo Yo. We lost him. He died. She died. And uh, so we, my daughter went to pick Stone there, and she picked him. But then he picked me because if I come home when I get home tonight, he'll be standing at the door waiting for me. Uh, when I go to bed, he'll be sitting on my pillow waiting for me. And my wife says. That's your puppy. That's not a cat. That's your. <laughs> I was like, cats don't do that. But okay, all right. So, and so you had some references that you had listed here. Uh, for some, some for me. Yes. And and guys, and, uh, I, I, and thank I, you for sharing lady. that story with me. I like <laughs> that was great. But uh, I am not the expert on 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 the hiring process and everything. If you get nothing else out of me today, I, what I want you to take with it, try it. Only thing they can do is say no. If you if you look through it, you don't understand it, call um, or email, uh, write whoever is at the bottom of that, that list. And like I said, USA or USA job listing tells you everything. And a lot of times at the bottom of there, it'll tell you who is the person who is the responsible for that hiring, which is what I did when I got my job with USCIS. I looked at it, I called them up and said, hey, this job says listed in multiple locations here in the United States. 
I want to stay here in Kansas City area. Can I stay? Can I apply only for that this this particular position? And they answered all my questions, uh, specifically that one about staying in Kansas City. Uh, so get on there, look through it. If you re think you're remotely eligible for the, the position, whether it's through a veteran hiring authority that's listed up there or through the student process, one of the internships, um, put your name in there, put your hat in the, in, in, in the barrel, and who knows, you may be eligible, you may get a chance, you may get a call. Cool. Um, I just wanted to send a quick reminder that I will send a follow-up uh, email. In addition to the recording, I will send a separate communication to everyone who attended today with these resources that uh, Dr. were just shared, these links that you see on the screen, as well as the uh, new information you shared about the law enforcement hiring event, and even the links to the recruitment webinars that you shared earlier. So I'm going to send those out uh, before the end of the day today. Mm -hmm. So um, just wanted to let everybody know that those will be um, on the way. Um, so just checking to see if we have any more questions from the group, and I don't think we have any, but um, if you do have questions, um, we welcome folks to email uh, sure. email Mike directly at the email that you see here, which I'll also send to you. Um, but Mike, I really appreciate you being here today. This provides some great information about the Pathways program and um, some ways to get involved there. And I just wanted to um, just remind our listeners that as Grantham students and alumni, we definitely invite you to take part in our career launch program, which is a comprehensive um, and self-paced uh, career management program that we've developed to help um, help you with all your needs from goal direction, career goal direction, resume, cover letter creation, interview skills, uh, social networking, salary negotiation, and even more. Um, so while it is self-paced, we are here on staff to help you, guide you along the way. So we invite you to uh, take part of that program. It is free, so you can register at any time. Um, if you have questions, you can call us direct at 1-800-955-2527, extension 173, or you can email us direct at careerservices at grantham.edu. Again, Dr. Edwards, I appreciate you joining us today. We appreciate all our guests for listening in, and we will talk to you soon. Thank you.